Welcome back to our series on the history of the Hebrew New Testament and Messianic Judaism. This is our 10th conversation around the Zalkinson Ginsburg Hebrew New Testament, and it's our fourth and final conversation about Emanuel Deutsch. We will be turning now to uh, Emanuel Deutsch's personal story as told by two of his closest friends. Uh, we'll begin here by looking at the memoir that we touched on in our previous conversation. So this is from the, uh, the, his writings, which were published after his death, um, within a year after his death, by uh, Lady Strangford. So let's get a little bit of background about her first, and then we'll go ahead and we'll look at some key passages from the memoir. So this is uh, a little bit about Lady Strangford from Wikipedia. There's a, something of a portrait of her there, and uh, we have another actual photograph of her that I'll show you in just a moment. Um, what would be worth pointing out here specifically? Mm, I want to show you a little bit about her her husband who uh, who died at a at a young age also. Uh, for now, I'll just point out when she was when she was born, when she died, um, a couple of the things that she did. If you want, you can you can pause this and look at look at look it over or or look this up for yourself on Wikipedia. Um, but that's a little bit a little bit about her for you. Interesting that she died on the SS Lusitania, by the way. Um, okay, send also a little bit about her husband here, who was um, the Right Honorable Viscount Strangford, and there's a faint photograph of him. His full name was uh, really quite long, as you can see here, but his his first name was Percy the 8th Viscount Strangford. And so a little bit about uh, Lady Strangford's relationship with with her husband. Uh, they were married in 1862. Uh, he was 37 and she was 36. And uh, sadly, he, he died only seven years later in 1869. So he was 44 at the time and uh, Lady Strangford was, was 43. And... Um, Rather, rather tragically, both her husband and Emanuel Deutsch, who was a, a close friend of hers, they both died uh, roughly the same age, around age 44. Here's a photograph of Lady Strangford. Um, after her husband's death, she, she worked as a nurse in London for uh, seven years until 1876, um, after which she went to Bulgaria to start hospitals there. She was apparently a very deeply compassionate and also um, active woman. And uh, this is probably the time frame when she met Emanuel Deutsch in London and um, had whatever interactions they, they had. Um, we don't know if there were feelings between them or not. You know, we, we already saw that Emanuel Deutsch was, very, he was, very, he was a very small man. And uh, what we'll also see in um, her, Lady Strangford's own description of him that he, he wasn't a physically attractive person. Um, but at the same time, um, he had a, a very bright and, and beautiful soul. So again, you know, we don't we don't know if um, if it's possible that there were there were some feelings between uh, Lady Strangford, who was a widow at that time, and um, Deutsch. What we do know is that she was the sole beneficiary in Deutsch's will, and that she wrote a very uh, a very a very touching and deeply insightful um, memoir about him, which we'll be looking at in just a moment. Uh, we also know that she actually. Um, was in communication with uh, Marianne Evans, George Eliot, as she composed her her, bio, her biography about Emanuel Deutsch. So um, in all probability, George Eliot contributed some of the necessary information for that. All right, so this is the beginning of the memoir. Of course, we're not going to just read through this whole thing. It is available, though, in the, um, in the PDF of uh, The Literary Remains of Emanuel Deutsch. And uh, as always, the link to that PDF should be somewhere on this video, uh, maybe underneath it at the top of the bottom of the page or something, depending on where you are watching these videos. All right, so having said that, um, I'll just point out a, a couple key things here for you. So we learned, um, we already learned that uh, Emanuel Deutsch began uh, studying uh, the traditional Jewish literature, the Talmud, etc., and of course the Hebrew Bible itself, um, under his uncle David Deutsch. If I'm not mistaken, there were there were four brothers. David was one of them, and three of them were rabbis. Um, I think Emmanuel's own father may have been the only one who wasn't a rabbi, but don't quote me on that. 
Um, it mentions his, his severe education for, uh, for so young a student. Um, uh, winter and summer, he got up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Um, he studied without fire or food for an hour or two. Um, did the, the shakarit, the, the daily morning prayers for an hour. And then, um, and then just studied all day long until 8 p.m., and uh, at the top, the top right here, we learn that he was uh, he was allowed to go to play for 15 minutes out of the day, and he was also uh, here. It says one quarter of an hour being the only time allowed for recreation, and about the same for exercise and fresh air. So maybe he was allowed out twice a day for 15 minutes. He had two 15-minute um, recesses. Um, it sounds like he he looked back and really felt. Um, well, he uses the term. Uh, pain. He used to look back to those years with painful self-pity. It sounds like it was a really a, a difficult thing for him. Um, something else uh, notable here is that his, uh, you know, every every uh, Jewish person has the, you know, uh, the Torah portion that was being read by the Jewish community around the world um, during the week that the week, that week that they were born, and then of course that would be the the the. the you know, for a, for a young man, his bar mitzvah portion. So it's interesting here that Deutsch's bar mitzvah portion, his own personal Torah portion, so to speak, was the one about about Abram uh, going going out. Um, definitely, we do see that in Deutsch's life, not only in the sense of him moving from Germany to England, but also in the sense of him um, doing some very great pioneering work, um, like we talked about in our previous conversation. Um, you know, daring to talk about the Jewishness of Jesus and the Jewish roots of Christianity, uh, daring to, um, you know, bring forth uh, many of these these old writings um, from the Talmud and whatnot, and show how they shed light on the New Testament. Um, he was a pioneer in that regard. In that regard, he he really was like his his father Abraham, uh, who who also had to had to get out, um, get thee out, and uh, go on his own journey. I'll we'll skip to the next page here. A little bit more about his education. Um, he had a very intense religious and also secular education. We touched on that. Definitely a child prodigy. Um, he was already in university. They made special uh, allowances for him, which was very unusual at the time. And he was already um, at the University of Berlin at the age of, um, at the very at the very oldest, 16, possibly even um even earlier, he did continue his religious religious studies from the looks of things, um, studying Talmud, for instance, and he uh, he worked himself through through university. Um, he looks like he learned English along the way, and uh, he he did a lot of reading in uh, classical English literature. So uh, a brilliant young man, and clearly very dedicated. There's a, a quote from him. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but it'll give you a little bit of a sense of uh, his experience of his education growing up with this, this dual uh, religious and secular education. He said, Before I knew how to read and write the language of the land wherein I was born, which was Germany, my lips were, or was it? I think, I think, well, he went to the University of Berlin anyways. Um, anyways, one of these, uh, one of these countries. He says, My lips were taught to stammer the olive bed and to recite my prayers in the tongue of David. As I grew up, Homer and Virgil stood side by side on my boyish bookshelf with the Mishnah and the Midrash. And before I was inured in the academy of Plato and his friends, it was deemed well to steep my soul for a time absolutely in that ocean called the Talmud and to teach me fierce dialectics in the discussions of Ravin and Rav Ashi before I learned to contrast the fierce lightnings that shook the rafters of Sura and Pumbadisa, those are like some of the big cities where the Talmud was eventually written down, by the way, um, with the mild, serene, ironically smiling lips of Socrates. All right, so that, that's his very poetic um, and articulate description of uh, his, his dual education, so to speak. We'll uh, skip to the end of this quote here. He, he mentions his, his feelings about working at the British Museum. 
It sounds like that he really was living the dream, getting to work at the British Museum. Then, for nigh twenty years, it was my privilege to dwell in the very midst of that pantheon called the British Museum, the treasures whereof, be the Egyptian, Homeric, Palimpsest, or Babylonian cuneiforms, the mutilated glories of the Parthenon, Parthenon, sorry, or the uh, Etruscan mysterious grotesqueness, were all at my beck and call. All days, all hours. Alexandria, Rome, Carthage, Jerusalem, Sidon, Tyre, Athens. And apparently the quote ends there. But you definitely get a sense of just how intelligent and well-educated Deutsch was and uh, how he was he was interested not just in the Jewish history and writings, but in, in world history and writings also, which probably gave him the ability to uh, to do some of the work that he did, not only to be passionate about his own Jewish people in the restoration of Israel, um, but also to uh, to relate the the Jewishness of Jesus to the to the broader Christian world in in ways that uh, that were meaningful and really lit people up. So, continuing on here, uh, Deutsch. Looks like he started working at the British Museum in 1855. So he would, he would have been about 25 years old at that time. And uh, then in the top right here, we see uh, it mentions some of the, the writing that he did, which we already touched on, uh, writing for different encyclopedias and uh, dictionaries. Um, notably, uh, Christian David Ginsburg also wrote for a couple of these. Uh, at the very least, Smiths and Kittos, and uh, who knows if there may have been a little bit of um, interaction between them over that, or they may have become more aware of each other and their work. Um, Ginsburg spent a lot of time at the British Museum, also, so it's highly um, it's highly likely that they, they 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 met, they crossed paths, and they they interacted there. And then, of course, it also mentions his. Watershed article on the Talmud, which came out in 1867 when he was 38 years old. All right, we're going to skip on a little bit here. And uh, we learn that in the spring of 1869, he was able to ten take 10 weeks off and travel to the Middle East and uh, visit Israel and some of the surrounding countries like Phoenicia. And this, uh, let's see if it's, if it's here. It sounds like he, it was a very, uh, very emotional experience for him. This is a famous quote from Deutsch. The East, all my wild yearnings fulfilled at last. Um, he goes on to, he goes on to mention that whenever he, Whenever he, pretty much whenever he talked about going to the uh, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and the, uh, the the Kotel, the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall, as it's called, altern alternately, um, he he pretty much always choked up with emotion, um, just talking about that. So clearly a very a very meaningful and special trip to for him, and uh, so this was um, this was the, he would have been um, about thirty nine, a little bit before forty years old when he went on this trip. Um, shortly after this, though, it does it does sound like uh, the the dark cloud began began to come over his life. So he was he was traveling, uh, delivering lectures, as you can see here, and then in the fall of um, in the fall of that time of eighteen sixty nine. So this would have been roughly when he turned forty. Um, it mentions that he 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 fell into a state of of, of depression. Um, Possibly, you know, from from overworking. It sounds like he he lost a couple of dear friends, and um, he may have already been sick and just wasn't even aware of it. Um, it does mention that he was almost entirely sleepless at that time. And um, we'll read another little bit of a quote here. So this is this is shortly after he turned forty in December of eighteen sixty nine. He says, uh, "I have certain words in my possession." which have been given me, that they might be said to others, few or many. There is within me the whole terrible sum of throes and woes, which made Rebecca, I believe, cry out against her double blessing. I know also that I shall not find peace or rest until I have said my whole say. And yet I cannot do it. And I yearn for things which I see, and that which might have been, 
and would have been blessing and sunshine and the cooling dew to the small germs within me. And yet, and yet, I know that I ought not to look to the right or to the left, that I ought to be resigned, that I ought to fight down manfully every tear that wells up in my lonely heart, and that I ought to look but to the distant stars and work on. But if I break down occasionally, but I break down occasionally, and I want to know the reason why. And then he finishes the, we'll finish reading this quote with something that I would say is his own poetic description of, uh, of burnout. And if a goodly flame shoots up, there are also so many ashes rolling down besides, and the ashes last longer than the flame, so much longer. Now, it's a really touching uh, look at the, the inner life and the, the feelings of Emanuel Deutsch. Definitely a great soul, and uh, he felt very, very deeply and clearly he also felt very conflicted. All right, we're going to skip to the next page here. Here are some more, um, more things that he wrote. Spring of 1870, so this was, you know, he began to possibly get sick in the fall of 1869, so, you know, half a year later, uh, Strangford writes, the, the, the frightful struggle of his naturally robust condition began against the advancing disease. And then she actually describes a little bit about his, uh, of, 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 how, of how he looked. So why don't we take a moment to read a little bit about that. She said, it's, it's not very easy to sketch the character of Mr. Deutsch, but we would fain draw some kind of portrait of him. He was of the oriental type of Jews, eyes and hair of the darkest, all right, so he had dark eyes and dark hair like a, you know, like a Jewish person, with the flexible, ever-varying, expressive mouth of the Israelite, all right, so he had a very, uh, very expressive mouth, um, a face <laughs> the reverse of handsome, all right, so that's, that's a description of the way he actually looked, um, Lady Strangford said he was, yeah, he was the reverse of handsome, but one that lighted up under the glow of an enthusiastic nature with a brightness that won the sympathies of the coldest listener. So he may have not been physically attractive. Um, she goes on to say that he was very small of stature, but um, apparently he was just one of the brightest people you could ever meet. And it sounds like people just loved him for that. He really lit people up. Um, he was sturdy and strong in make and until the last three years of his life, blessed with robust health and spirits that no work seemed to tire, no trials to exhaust. She goes on to mention that if there's anything that he lacked, it was self-control. He really didn't take good care of his body, of his health. Uh, he didn't eat enough. He didn't sleep enough. And uh, it sounds like he basically just ran his health right into the ground. And uh, in all probability, that caused his, his early death. Next page. It mentions here um, in, in the the middle left that um, he was a very bright person. We already mentioned that, and also that he was um, he was very sensitive. It's a um, it's a, I think it's a, it can be a rare combination for for an academic like that to also uh, to be a, an exceptionally bright and sensitive person. So a very a very big soul, almost larger than life. We uh, see on the on the right hand side here. Where are we? Talking about his physical weaknesses. He kept working, even though it was really hard. She mentions she mentions that uh, frequently denying himself in order to send assistance to the old family at home. So um, he kept working, and uh, you know part of that was because he wanted to continue to send money back to his parents um, in in Europe. All right, next page. Oh, and it mentions a little bit about cancer here. That it, it in in hindsight, it sounds like after they they realized that he probably had cancer but they weren't sure during his actual life exactly what it was. She has quite a lovely description of his personality here also. Why don't we read this little paragraph together? He had the fervid temperament of a poet, the tender heart of a woman, and a certain simplicity of nature that broke out occasionally as in a child. Intense in everything, he carried out a purity of life that showed no common self-restraint in one so ardent and so warm of heart, religiously blameless to the last. He was reverent without superstition, 
and free from prejudice notwithstanding his earnest, passionate attachment to his country and to his people. So that's definitely another thing that Deutsch had in common with Ginsburg. Um, they were both brilliant academics and great authors, and at the same time, uh, they also had this romantic, poetic uh, temperament, uh, a fervid temperament, as uh, Strangford mentions here. And that's probably one of the things that made them so uh, made them so influential in their in their time and enabled them to to make such a difference um, in the world. So looking, moving on here. It sounds like he was uh, he was getting sicker and sicker in the autumn of 1872. Um, he just wanted to go back to the Middle East, and um, his friends were were able to uh, work and get him a six months leave um, from from work at the British Museum, and so he um, he went to Italy, and then from there, it sounds like from there to Egypt, and this really was close to the the end of his life. Now, um, when he took this six months break. Um, it was a, it was a, it was a, it, uh, like a, a year before this, roughly, that uh, Ginsburg dedicated his his book about the Moabite stone to him. By the way, and you know, Ginsburg had acknowledged in his his book about the Moabite stone uh, that that Deutsch was was sick, and uh, perhaps that was part of why he he dedicated that book to him as a, as a token of his personal esteem. All right. Um, so, anyways, he makes it to. Uh, Alexandria. He makes it to uh, to Egypt. It was winter. It was cold and damp. Uh, Cairo was overcrowded because of uh, some local events. Um, Deutsch was was left cold and shivering. Uh, next page here. It sounds like um, I think it mentions he took a, t a trip on a, a steamer, and then he came back. Um, was able to find a couple different places to stay as as he was really was was fading out. Okay, he gets back to Cairo. Three weeks of intense suffering. Um, so he was taken to a hospital in Alexandria, and uh, at that point he he really couldn't even get out of bed. His last words were, "I only wish for peace." Um, despite the fact that Deutsch spoke very positively about Jesus of Nazareth and wasn't afraid to talk about the Jewish roots of Christianity and speak of Christianity in, uh, in, in warm terms. Um, he was still seen as being Jewish. He was accepted by the Jewish community and he was buried in the Jewish cemetery at Alexandria. And um, it's, it's notable what was written on his, his tombstone. Um, the well-beloved, whose heart was burning with good things, whose pen was the pen of a ready writer, we learn here his father's name, by the way. So his Hebrew name was Menachem, and his father's name was Abraham. I want you to take note of that for later. His name was Menachem ben Avraham. Uh, we see here also that he was born on Rosh Chodesh. He was born on the uh, the new moon uh, of the month uh, Marcheshvan. And then the uh, there's a verse that's given, and then Strangford actually explains the uh, the, the quotation um, having to do with how every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has its numerical as well as its lingual value, and uh, dates are, are therefore um, kind of enc encoded in verses. And so his verse on his tombstone was, Arise, arise shine, for thy light is come. And then it also has a, an English inscription, and uh, which was translated also into German and... Arabic. So that's a little bit of uh, Lady Strangford's uh, biography about Emanuel Deutsch, um, which she wrote in communication with George Eliot. So there may have been some some facts about Deutsch that made their way into this memoir uh, from from Marianne Evans herself, also another dear friend of Deutsch's. We're now going to look at a second uh, a second account, especially uh, about his last years from another couple close friends of his. So this, this, uh, this memorial, 
came out in the Contemporary Review, as you can see here, uh, within a year of his death. And uh, it was written by um, Hugh Howes, and we'll learn more about him in just a moment before I point one thing out. So um, he, 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 he mentions here, for nearly two years before his death, he had been practically, he had practically disappeared from the world, and for one year at least he was hardly seen by some of those who had been his most intimate associates. He passed the greater part of that sad time in my house. All right, so for the, basically for the last two years of his life, he lived with this um, younger couple. So firstly, we have, um, we have Hugh Reginald Howes, who was a, um, a reverend and a preacher. And um, <clears throat> here's a, what would you call that? An artistic version of him. I wonder if one of the reasons that they may they may have clicked, so to speak, is we we read a little bit about the description uh, of the Reverend. It says that um, he, he he conducted services and he did so with unconventional methods um, that, combined with his dwarfish figure and lively manner, soon attracted crowded congregations. So um, both both Deutsch and Howes were very small men. And uh, it sounds like they were also very alive and energetic. And that could be that they really saw something of themselves in each other and uh, were, really, were really drawn to each other in friendship as a, as a result. <clears throat> so Hugh was nine years younger than Deutsch. And uh, he was married to Mary, whom we will now see here. Um, Mary Eliza. And um, I'll point out a couple things about, about Mary also. So she was 10 years younger than Hugh, and 19 years younger than Emanuel Deutsch. Um, lots of information here about her. It's really quite interesting. Um, I will just point out here that when she was 17 or 18, she became a member of, uh, of Hugh's congregation, and she would go every Sunday, and she would always take notes on his sermons with a pen and paper. I can't help but wonder if maybe he noticed that and felt just a little bit complimented. Um, her dad died um, a year after that, um, she she married the reverend. Um, they had four kids. Sadly, uh, the first one died in infancy in 1869, as you can see here. Um, sounds like life life uh, life with Hugh was quite an adventure. He was a popular preacher, you know, and he actually went on uh, preaching tours. Um, which eventually became annual tours of of North America and continental Europe, so that that gave her a lot of exposure to the broader world. Um, she was also um, similar to La Lady Strangford, actually. She was a strong woman and outspoken, and she really, really, really cared about social issues and uh, social social causes. There's a bit of a description of that here. Um, she was outspoken for on behalf of women's rights. Um, she also cared about animals. As you can see at the bottom here, she was part of the anti-vivisection campaign. And uh, something that's uh, really quite um, nifty here also is it says, for personal protection, she kept a secret revolver concealed in her purse. All right, so that gives you a, a little bit of a sense of, uh, of Reverend Hugh's wife, who was uh, quite a strong and lively person in her own right. I don't know how many women carried revolvers in their purses in, uh, in Victorian England. That may have been... A bit of an anomaly. All right. So, anyways, that's a little bit about about Hugh and Mary, um, as we as we saw on the the title page of Hugh's memorial uh, about Emmanuel Deutsch. Something else I want to point out here is uh, okay. So they 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 first met. He he mentions here that he first knew Mr. Deutsch about 1865, and he mentions I was in the habit of meeting him occasionally at Sydenham. Um, now, you may remember that term before. Um, from my understanding, that was um, those social gatherings that um, George Eliot and her husband would go to, you know, where they would spend time with Emmanuel Deutsch and other um, key movers and shakers in, uh, in, in London society, authors, thinkers, um, editors, um, communicators, and, and, and such. So it sounds like uh, it sounds like Hugh was a, a part of this broader social circle, um, not surprisingly. So you really, you really, you know, we don't have a picture of Emanuel Deutsch, but definitely we we have pictures of some of his closest friends, and uh, we also we also I think get a better feel uh, 
for Emmanuel Deutsch as we as we get a feel for his friends. Uh, you know, we have Lady Strangford on the left here. And then we have um, Hugh and uh, Mary Howes on on the right. And uh, you you get this you get this picture of a of a circle of friends who were who were offbeat, who didn't totally fit in, but at the same time were were, were brilliant, intelligent people. Uh, they were lively. They were larger than life. They were passionate. They cared about people, about what was going on in the world, about about um about social causes. And, and, and about about their societies. And Emmanuel Deutsch was right there in the thick of it all. So, yeah. Having given you that little uh, little overview, why don't we go ahead now and we'll actually look at a little bit of this memorial and get a uh, yet more personal glimpse of Emmanuel Deutsch, especially in his later years of life. Okay, so firstly, let's see... This is this is really beautiful. There's a little uh, uh, one of one of Deutsch's memories from his boyhood, and uh, conversations he used to have with his dad that really that were defining moments for him. Um, which, which really, yeah, defining in the sense of you know he he went on to write this article about the Talmud, and apparently this is a story he told more than once. Um, so um, how how I don't even know how to say his name. Is it Howes? I'm not sure. Anyways, I'll, we'll say Howes. So Howes says that. I kind of want to just say Hugh. He was such a great name. So Hugh says he has often told me how, when he was a little boy, his father would read out to him passages of the Talmud and explain their touching import, unfolding to him their deep connection with Jewish modes of thought and character, until the barest ceremony would stand out full of tender spiritual meaning, and the boy often melted into tears as the ancient page became lit up for him once more with that sacred charm which made every letter of it so dear to the Jews of old. So clearly, uh, Deutsch grew up not just studying Talmud as some boring, dusty old book and just going through the motions of religious ritual, but his, his dad talked with him on his level and really spoke to his heart and showed him, showed him what it meant and made it human to him. And it sounds, once again, it sounds like those conversations with, with his father. His father, Avraham, were, uh, were defining moments for him. A little bit more about the beginning of uh, Deutsch's declining health, we'll uh, we'll we'll read um, some of this paragraph here. So um, the Reverend says, I, "I it was I think late in the summer of 1869 that I first spoke seriously to Mr. Deutsch about the state of his health." Um, so you know this this um, Strang Lady Strangford also mentioned that it was in the fall of 1869 that his health really began to take a downward turn. He experienced sleeplessness, depression, etc. Um, he continues, We met at a country house, and after dinner I walked up and down the lawn with him alone for about an hour, and instead of listening to him as I was always glad to do, I talked almost incessantly. I missed in him the spontaneous, light-hearted flow of spirits. His gaiety seemed more forced. He was excited and restless. He looked worn and anxious. He told me he got no sleep, and I then had a very strange and strong presentiment that all was not right. So strong that... Although a mere acquaintance, I charged him with overworking himself, and I implored him to rest in time. We spoke of some eminent men who had lately broken down under the strain of work. I found that he was in the habit of writing all uh, habit at times of writing all night. The three famous Times articles, for which he was paid a hundred pounds, were produced under enormous pressure. Throughout, he was determined that neither his special studies nor his literary work should interfere with the exact discharge of his official duties at the British Museum. In the morning, often found him still pen in hand after a night spent in sleepless toil. Then he would hastily swallow some breakfast and appear at the British Museum at the regulation hour. There, his midday meal was often neglected or omitted altogether. He was trading madly upon an iron frame. He goes on, at the bottom of this page here to say, I remember urging him to marry, and I then became acquainted with his peculiar view upon the subject, which he has often repeated to me since. Never to marry was a settled principle in his life. He thought it at all times a hazardous experiment for two people to make, especially in a country where legal separation was very difficult. Personally, as regarded himself, he was extremely open and explicit, and I never knew him to waver. He said, I should never marry if I lived a hundred years. I don't want to be a happy man. My mother longs so for me to find a wife, but a man either marries or becomes great. 
the more diverse his interests, the worse for what ought to observe his, observe his whole life, his work. Okay, and then he goes on to mention some people from history who had bad experiences of marriage. If a man had been great and happy married, still he might have been greater single. His own father, he would say, would have been a most remarkable man had he never married, and that had been a lesson to him. All right, so a little bit of his background. Now, um, there, were, there were rumors that floated around about Deutsch. Uh, you know how people, people talk, rumors of him being in love, for instance. His response was that he didn't care. He would simply say, let them clank. <laughs> um, the Reverend goes on to describe him as being a true Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Um, he really looked down on tittle-tattle, and he had a, the most lo genuine loathing for immorality. Um, he was scrupulously clean. And then, um, in reference to himself, he'd simply say, I am I. <laughs> Let them clank. I am I. He goes on here to, um, this is interesting because, of course, you know, the Reverend and, and Deutsch were both short men. Um, so the Reverend writes that Mr. Deutsch slowly, very slowly, awakened to the fact that, with a few exceptions, he was officially surrounded by men not only mentally, but with a few exceptions, morally smaller than himself. So he may have been a small man, but mentally and morally, he was a, he was a big man. And uh, that apparently applied to his work at the British Museum also. It sounds like at the same time he was, um, he was really quite helpful. I'll read a little bit more about that here. He had ambition, but his ambition was of the noblest order, not to achieve, but to deserve fame. He therefore of all men was content to wait, and he did wait, and work in happy obscurity for 18 years. He was the most joyous, the most helpful, the most generous, the most guileless of men. Right and left, he was used by scholars and students. If anything was wanted in the museum, Mr. Deutsch was the man. If any other department was in difficulty, an insoluble problem, an illegible inscription, characters that no one could read, books no one could catalog, references no one could make out, Mr. Deutsch was applied to and never applied to in vain. He didn't seem to notice that men unworthy of him often sucked his brains. He was never jealous that others should get the credit of work done by him. The work was done. The cause, the good cause, he would often say, referring to the advance of his own special studies, had been helped on. What does it matter, was his constant reply, when I remonstrated with him for allowing himself to be pumped right and left. So it's another beautiful uh, insight into Deutsch's character and just how incredibly humble and helpful he was. And then um, the Reverend describes that moment when he wrote the Talmud article and he was catapulted into fame. He mentions, um, but when in one moment he, le he, le he leaped into fame with the Talmud article, when constant inquiries for him at the British Museum brought his obscure name perpetually before his superiors, when an official invitation to the opening of the Suez Canal arrived from the Viceroy of Egypt to Mr. Deutsch of the British Museum, when it was known that a public banquet had been given to him at Edinburgh, that flattering invitations had reached him to visit the United States and deliver lectures, when the Royal Institution opened its doors to him for the same purpose, when one of our royal princesses considered herself fortunate in securing the first manuscript page of the Talmud article, when, Mit when Mr. Deutsch became against his will the lion of a London season, an honored guest at the table of the Prime Minister, and even a stock subject of public comment at the popular entertainments of the day. That's a great example of just basically he became very well known and famous in his own way. His article was translated into a bunch of languages. And um, so at, the, at that point, some of Deutsch's friends and allies wrote a letter um, asking that, that Deutsch be promoted, basically. He was like a regular guy working at the British Museum, and uh, they wanted him to... Um, they wanted him to um, be appointed the keeper of Semitic antiquities at the British Museum. Unfortunately, 
that letter which they wrote never even made it to the people it was intended for. It was simply shelved. Um, quote, the document being slightly inaccurate in its technical terms of address. So it never made it there. And apparently that was really hard on Deutsch. Um, obviously he was a very good-hearted and generous man. It sounds like at the same time some people didn't like him and uh, perhaps um, simply simply they had they just had something against him. And uh, so it sounds like that was painful, and he he became he became what does it say here? Um, from having been the most open, generous, good-natured, and, and amiable of men, to become at last the most reserved, cold, cautious, and suffering of the subordinates in the British Museum. And uh, this wasn't just the Reverend who wrote this way. A lot of uh, Deutsch's closest friends were really mad at how he was treated at the British Museum, and they, they, they called it out. And I'm not going to get into uh, all of that here, but it, it sounds like um, they believe that things could have gone differently for him, and maybe he wouldn't have, have gotten sick and died if he had actually um, you know, been given a promotion, paid more, um, maybe, maybe given a, uh, put in an office at the British Museum that, that, that he actually would have deserved and that he, would have been, that he was capable of. All right, so he's experiencing pain. Um, he's needing to be drugged. Um, let's see, he undergoes a test operation. I marvel, he writes, that I live to tell the tale. I now am opiated and hocused and stupefied. So, sounds like um, maybe uh, maybe that would be the Deutsch version of, of drunk texting, as the kids would call it. Um, but even, even in his uh, drunk texting, so to speak, <laughs> sounds like he was still really quite... Uh, articulate in how he expressed himself. All right. It has a description here of his last three years of life. Um, he says, we, we think of the last three years of his life, which consisted of nothing but a series of medical and surgical appliances, some of inconceivable horror. Remember, they didn't know what he was sick with, so they, they did some different operations, they did some different things to him, and I mean, it wasn't even what he was sick with, what they were trying to treat. And a succession of protracted bodily ag agonies, disappointments, and bitter humiliations with which those who are witness of can never remember without tears. So, so it sounds like the Reverend was the one who would give him his, his usual opiates at night and... Um, come and see him see in the morning and he hadn't eaten his breakfast he was having a hard time eating he wasn't uh, he wasn't seeing visitors anymore seeing his friends in general and then um, surprisingly in the midst of all that he uh, he went back to work it sounds like that was something he he had to do too. Or maybe before that, though, I will mention one point out one more thing before we move on. It mentions here he couldn't even sleep for more than like 30 to 45 minutes, even when he was like really heavily drugged. Um, he was just in, in so much pain. And so, yeah, it was in the midst of all that that he decided to go back to work at the British Museum. And so that's it's, uh, described in the bottom left here. It's poor guy. It sounds like he just looked looked horrible. It was obvious he wasn't doing well at all. And uh, the British Museum was a terrible place to work at too. Um, it was too hot, um, too cold. Um, you know, he was sick. Um, it mentions his salary was uh, three hundred pounds a year, and um, they just they just gave him like stuff to do that wasn't even that important, which clearly wasn't wasn't easy for him either. It sounds like it was rather insulting. All right, so he, he um, goes to stay at a friend's place. Skip to the next page here. We have some we have some excerpts of from uh, letters that um, he wrote to his his close friends Hugh and Mary. He mentions that they were sometimes almost illegible, but he, he wrote little letters to them almost every day. And uh, you can definitely hear his um, his humor coming out, even in the midst of intense pain. It sounds like he never lost his his sense of humor. And I'm not going to 
read all of these, but you know, if you want, pause and look these over, or you can read the whole. This PDF is in the PDF collection also, of course, so you can read the whole thing if you want. Um, next page. More excerpts from letters. They go. Uh, they go on us on a vacation with him, to a uh, to a spa. Where is this? No, sorry, it's not a spa. That's the name of the city. Um, they joined him at spa. I think uh, it sounds like he, they went to kind of a spa-like location, though. Anyways, um, maybe that's where we get the word spa from. I, well, feel free to look into that. It's a little bit outside the scope of, of this. All right. It sounds like there was a point where he actually, he actually got upset with them. He was just having such a hard time, it wasn't himself, so to speak. Um, this is this is very notable right here, this little paragraph here. So apparently he called um, he called Hugh's wife Mary. He called her um, he called her mother. <laughs> she was nineteen years younger than him. Um, and he says here in one of his lucid moments, he said to my wife, "Do you know, mother?" that was his name for her, there's a frightful curse, a nameless curse, laid on the man who touches or divulges certain sanctities in the Talmud. And I, the first man for hundreds of years, who could read the secrets, have done it, and the curse has come upon me. So that's, you know, that's, that's an example of how uh, Deutsch dared to bring certain things from um, the ancient Jewish writings to light and uh, make them public, and apparently he believed that it was a possibility he somehow broke broke a rule and a, and a curse came upon him for it. There is a, a delightful little instance of his uh, his sense of humor, which was very punny in the bottom left here. It says, One Sunday, to, ar to rouse him from some depressed train of reflections, my wife said, how, how you do moralize? You ought to keep a Sunday school. So I do, he answered. That is why I have no fire today, looking at the cold ashes. All right, so she says, you ought to keep a Sunday school. He points out that the fire is out. Ah, that's what I'm doing. What do you mean? I have no fire in order that I may keep my Sundays cool. <laughs> and apparently um, he was almost insensible with acute pain when he, he, he cracked that joke. Sunday school, Sundays cool. I love puns personally, so I really appreciated that. Um, middle right, really sad little story here. So you remember that um, Hugh and Mary's first child died um, in, what was it, 1869. So this wouldn't have been their first child. But definitely it sounds like they had experienced their own tragedies. Um, so they did have another, another little boy. And uh, it says that um, as he was leaving for, leaving for um, Egypt, which would have been the last time that they... They saw him. It says, um, He asked for a little boy, of whom he was extremely fond, for he loved little children. Even little gutter children delighted him. I assume that's homeless kids? I'm not sure. Anyways, the little fellow, two years old, ran up to him and kissed him, and kept saying over and over again, Poor Uncle Deutsch! Poor Uncle Deutsch! It seemed to my wife like a fatal omen revealed to babes. You'll come back, she said half lightly, and you won't care a bit for us. After six months' absence, you will have wholly forgotten us, he said very earnestly. No, I shan't. So it sounds like he knew that he was in the the last legs of his his journey of life in this world. Um, last pages here. We have more um, excerpts from his writings as he drew closer to death. Cairo in um, mid-January, for instance. Um... So uh, let's see, of course, he, he died in, in May, if I'm not mistaken. He, um, the Reverend writes, The last autograph letter we got from him is dated Cairo, the 31st of March. There he was dangerously worse, but thoughtful to the last. He didn't tell us this, and I feel certain that he himself believed that he would be able to get back in time to die with us, a thought which was uppermost in his mind when he left us. It's really touching. If there was anybody that he just wanted to die, um, 
having them around it would have been it would have been his friends Hugh and Mary a little a little bit here he writes with a uh, a triangle it sounds like this was some kind of, some kind of little code or inside humor um they men- he mentions their their son as as our little boy and um then he goes to Alexandria and that was the end of his life as told by Hugh and Mary um two of his closest friends uh you remember the uh, the presentation that was made by um Abraham's we uh, we looked at it a couple of times she uh she sums up <clears throat> She sums up Emmanuel Deutsch's um, character um, with a description that George Eliot used to describe Mordecai. You remember, of course, that Emmanuel Deutsch inspired the character of Mordecai in that that historic um, history-making novel. Um, so George Eliot wrote about Emmanuel Deutsch. He's not what I should call fanatical. Mordecai is an enthusiast. I should like to keep that word for the highest order of minds those who care supremely for grand and general benefits for mankind. He's not a strictly orthodox Jew, and is full of allowances for others. His conformity in many things is an allowance for the condition of other Jews. And um, that's the life of Emmanuel Deutsch. He inspired George Eliot to write Daniel Deronda, which inspired the Zionist movement, and uh, culminated, culminated with the, uh, the creation of the, um, the State of Israel. He never translated the New Testament into Hebrew, but he inspired a generation to learn about the Hebrew backdrop to the New Testament. We don't know if Deutsch believed in Yeshua. What we do know is that he was not ashamed to talk about the Jewish Jesus in a, at a time when almost everyone was. It's actually interesting to note the, the parallels between the uh, the life of Yeshua of Nazareth and Emmanuel Deutsch. I'll point out a couple of them to you here. Um, even his name is notable. So his, his Hebrew name was Menachem, which, uh, which means comforter. There was actually an old Jewish belief that the Messiah's name would be Menachem, that he would be the comforter. It's interesting that Yeshua talked about sending his spirit and that his spirit would be the comforter, which in Hebrew has the sense of the name Menachem. It's interesting too that it sounds like when Deutsch moved to England, he he took the um, the Hebrew name Emmanuel as his um, as his as his name by which he was known. I um, mean, you know, his full name was uh, Emmanuel Oscar Menachem Deutsch. So it sounds like Menachem was his Hebrew name. Um, Oscar maybe was his German name, his secular German name, and then Emmanuel was his secular, so to speak, English name. And of course, Emmanuel is another title of the Messiah, meaning God with us. Um, both of these men, um, Yeshua of Nazareth and um, and uh, Emmanuel Deutsch, um, they were they were both referred to as as Ben Avraham. Literally, Deutsch, his father's name was Avraham, so he was literally Ben Avraham. Um, you know, that's something that Yeshua was called in Matthew chapter one verse one, the very first verse in the Gospels in the New Testament. Um, Yeshua was also referred to as the Ben David, the son of David. It's interesting that uh, Deutsch received his religious education from his uncle, David. And uh, in, in Jewish thought, your, your teacher, your rabbi, is your spiritual father. So spiritually speaking, Deutsch was, was literally uh, the Ben David. Um, both of these men literally went down to Egypt. Yeshua in his childhood years, the beginning of his life, and Deutsch in his later years at the end of his life. We don't have any record that either of them were physically attractive. We know that for sure about Emmanuel Deutsch. And then Isaiah 53 also talks about how the, the suffering servant wasn't someone who would be a really handsome individual. He wouldn't be physically attractive. That's not why people would desire him. Uh, neither of them married. It's not to say that it was for the same reasons, but it is interesting that neither of them married. They held no titles, uh, no offices. Uh, they had no power, whether it be political, military, military. You know, civil or economic power, but at the same time, they had great influence, and they changed the world by changing how people thought. They both had hidden years of obscurity. They were incredibly helpful. Nothing was beneath them. 
and they were also incredibly humble. When they finally became famous, they avoided the limelight and the crowds. It sounds like it made them uncomfortable. We don't know what either of them looked like. We have no pictures of them. All we know is that they were Jewish, and they probably looked like Jewish people looked and like Jewish people look. We do know that what their souls looked like, though, from their teachings, from the stories that people told about them, they didn't fit in boxes. Labels didn't stick. You couldn't always tell which side they were on. They were their own people. As Deutsch said, I am I. They were free thinkers. They were deeply authentic. This got them in trouble with the uh, establishment. They encountered resistance from the establishment. And uh, in both cases, it could be said that that contributed to their early deaths. They, they both mysteriously prophesied their own early deaths. And then indeed, they did both die young. At the same time, though, their stories didn't end with their deaths. In many ways, it was just the beginning of the influence that they had. Um, not only the, the positive influence on the, uh, the Jewish people and uh, the fulfillment of prophecies, um, ancient prophecies, uh, but also the influence they had on the, on the broader world. And then finally, both of these individuals mystically lived on in their friends. And I kept the best for last. In some ways, this was kept the best for last. Something came in the mail for me just yesterday. And um, I, would have, I would have shared it with you earlier when we were talking about George Eliot and her novel Daniel Deronda, but I didn't have it then. And I would like to, uh, I'd like to show it to you here. It's very, uh, very, very touching, very special to me. It is the book Daniel Deronda by George Eliot. And as you can see, it's a very old copy of the book. In fact, this book came out in 1877. Um, as you may remember, um, Deutsch died in 18, was it 70, 73? Um, at the age of 43, 44, around there. And uh, within, within a year of that, uh, George Eliot began writing the story of Daniel Deronda and then it actually became began coming out in uh, in installments in um, the spring in early 1876. So um, by 1877, the story of D Daniel Deronda had been fully published by uh, what was it um, Blackwood and Sons, and that same year, this book was published. So this book was published while George Eliot was still alive. It was published only a couple of years after Deutsch himself died. And uh, for that reason, it's it's very special. I'll show you just a couple of pages here. I don't know about you, but I love old books. I love the way they, the, the feel of them. I love the smell of them. And uh, definitely in this case, this book just, it, 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 it's it's the story. It has the story. On the uh, one of the little title pages at the beginning here, which is actually coming right out of the book, um, you can see there's a, a picture. It's depicting Daniel Deronda on his boat. And there's Mira in the, over on the side about to attempt suicide. And um, I guess in a way you could say that's where the story, Deronda's own um, Jewish story all began with him rescuing this, uh, this Jewish girl. I'll show you. Um, okay, there's the, there's the contents. I'll try to... This book is falling apart, so I, it's, it's kind of awkward trying to turn to the right page and show it to you. But here's, here's the table of contents, as you can see. Um... And there's the Mordecai. The Mordecai story kicks in at page 301. It's written in pretty pretty small print here. I'll, I'll show you an example of that too. All right, so here's here's page one of the actual story. Daniel Deronda, book one, The Spoiled Child. And, um, and there it is. So... I feel heaven smiling down upon us through being able to get a book like this. Um, I got it at a really good price. It's hard to get an 1877 copy of Daniel Deronda for a good price. So I feel, again, I just, I feel um, heaven smiling on us and on our remembering the story of Emmanuel Deutsch and um, the story of um, George Eliot and Daniel Deronda and uh, how how it all got started. I had mentioned 
just now and listed for you a bunch of almost eerie similarities between the lives of Yeshua of Nazareth and Emmanuel Deutsch, who dared to talk about him. And um, the last one I mentioned is how they both mystically lived on through their friends. I thought I would finish our four conversations about Emmanuel Deutsch with this. It's one of um, the last conversations between Mordecai, who was Emmanuel Deutsch, basically, and Daniel Deronda, the, um, the hero who um, answered the call to go to Israel and um, lead the Jewish people. This is Mordecai. It has begun already, uh, speaking to Deronda, it has begun already, the marriage of our souls. It waits but the passing away of this body, and then they who are betrothed shall unite in a stricter bond, and what is mine shall be thine. And I, as, as, as I read this, I want you to remember, think also, not just of Deutsch, but think about Yeshua of Nazareth and uh, his relationship with his disciples and some of his own last words um, before his own crucifixion. What is mine shall be thine. Call nothing mine that I have written, Daniel. For though our masters delivered rightly, that everything should be quoted in the name of him that said it, and their rule is good, yet it does not exclude the willing marriage which melts soul into soul and makes thought fuller as the clear waters are made fuller, where the fullness is inseparable and the clearness is inseparable. For I have judged what I have written, and I desire the body that I gave my thought to pass away as this fleshly body will pass. But let the thought be born again from our fuller soul, which shall be called yours. Thanks for joining me in these four conversations about Emanuel Deutsch. In our next conversation, we will return to the story of Christian David Ginsburg, who I would say was the greatest Hebrew scholar the English-speaking world has ever produced. We, uh, we, we, left, we, we kind of left off uh, Ginsburg's story in his epoch of fame, um, talking about his work on the Moabite stone, which he dedicated to Emanuel Deutsch. So we will pick up where we left off there with Ginsburg's epoch of fame. And I look forward to having you continue to join me for this saga.